Welcome to Lethal Dose, your favorite toxicology-focused podcast where we delve into true crime cases involving drugs and poisons. My name is Venus Dineko. I'm a layperson fascinated by true crime. My name is Kayla Woods. I'm an author and toxicologist. Let's get started. Sealed from DuPont Teflon. With Resolve, even grape juice comes out with ease. If you don't have stain resistant carpet, get Scotch Guard Fabric Protector. It keeps ordinary spills from becoming extraordinary stains on virtually any fabric. Use Scotch Guard Fabric Protector. Keep your bathroom cleaner longer, then you need new Clorox bathroom cleaner and Clorox toilet bowl cleaner with Teflon Surface Protector. Much like a magic. People think of Teflon and they think of frying pans. Teflon is not one thing. Putting Teflon on a surface will stop bugs from crawling up trees. They'll fall right off the tree. Teflon is a chain loop. This is something I've come up with for bicycles. You know, only DuPont makes Teflon. And you can use it in satellites, on fabrics, or leather. When's the last time you heard about a, a leather raincoat? <laughs> you can let your imagination run wild. It's not often that you get to make something new in this world. Venus, what do you know about PFAS chemicals? I don't know much. I feel like I know that they are toxic in some way and not good for you. And I want to say, like, I can't think of what category they are, but are they used in, like, food packaging or as a preservative in some way? Like, how (laughs) far off base am I? So they have been used in food packaging. They're not used as a preservative, but they are making headlines, like, right now. And we will get into that eventually. This is unfortunately a pretty timely episode. And there are, in the past five years or so, I think, there's been a lot of headlines that have involved PFAS chemicals. But we're going to go way back to the beginning. And so we probably won't get into the more timely stuff until maybe a second or possibly third part of this series. It is a big one. Okay. So the beginning of this story... And I will say what PFAS stands for soon, but before we knew what they were, they didn't have a name. So let's start there. On April 6th, 1938, a research chemist named Dr. Roy J. Plunkett at what was previously called E.I. DuPont de Nemours and Company, now just called DuPont, made an accidental discovery while attempting to develop a non-toxic refrigerant alternative to ammonia because... Before Freon even, we just used ammonia. DuPont had partnered with General Motors to produce Freon, and so Plunkett's team was examining other chlorofluorocarbons, which is probably another thing that you've heard of. That's CFCs. I was going to say, I've heard that before, but I didn't know what it was, and those are bad. Those are bad. They destroy those the ozone. Bad. Yeah. But they are not related to the PFAS chemicals we're going to talk about. Okay. It's just that their discovery was Tied. intertwined. Yeah. Okay. So one of the chemicals that they were researching was tetrafluoroethylene gas, which they were storing at extremely low temperatures until they were prepared to chlorinate them. And when they opened their container of the tetrafluoroethylene, they found that the TFE had spontaneously polymerized with the iron container, so the sides of the container. And they really didn't know what polymerization was back in the 1930s. They had obviously never seen it spontaneously happen. And so now they had polytetrafluoroethylene, which is PTFE, which might be another chemical that you've heard of. And they found that this 
chemical was corrosion and heat resistant. It created a wax and it had a low surface friction. It was very slippery. And so they opened up this container that they were expecting to see a gas in and they find instead this wax on the side of the containers and they're like, what is What this? happened here? Yeah. Yeah. So for a little insight into the chemistry of what happened... When something polymerizes, it makes a repeating chain of a molecule, which is the difference between a monomer, like TFE, and a polymer, like PTFE. And so that's how you can have polytetra, which literally means many four if you break it down. Okay. And so out of context, if you're not familiar with the naming conventions, that sounds really weird. But if you have polytetrafluoroethylene, it can be broken down like this. So you have your ethylene, that's your base thing, and that means a double bond between two carbons. Eth means two carbons, and ene means double bond. If you have tetrafluoro, that means on that double bond between two carbons, now you have four fluorines. And so carbon will always have hydrogen. Hydrogen just kind of like fills in places. And you might have seen that when looking at like trans fats, but... It's just, like, where the hydrogens are. So okay. on this one, where the hydrogens are, you've replaced it with tetrafluoro, four fluorines. So PTFE is just one example of a perfluoroalkyl substance, and that's what PFAS stands for. It's per mm. or polyfluoroalkyl substance. So this refers to a number of chemicals, yes, the PFAS. It's, it's, the PFAS is kind of like an umbrella. It's a huge umbrella. Okay, yeah. it's not It's not a chemical, one chemical itself. Yeah, it's more Got of it. a family. Got and it. So, but with all of the members of this family, because it's perfluoro, either all or many of the hydrogens have been replaced with fluorine. And so that's what we're looking at. Okay. So if not all of the binding sites of a base, if you will, molecule are replaced with fluorine, then it's a polyfluoroalkyl substance. And again, that's just PFAS. And it is written as PFAS. And so it's not PFASs or PFASs. It's PFAS. PFAS. And it covers about 4,700 compounds. Oh, wow. And that so includes, this is ginormous. Yeah, it's huge. It's a huge family. That includes PFCs, PFAAs, PFCAs, PASFs. PFAs, PFOSs, and PFOAs. And I'm just throwing all those out there because over the last five years, like I said, people may have heard of some of these compounds. Mm -hmm. So although research into PFCs, these polyfluoral compounds, began with CFCs related to Freon, they are not the same. They don't, that's the chlorofluorocarbons. Right, right. And okay. so they don't have the same, like they don't hurt the ozone and things like that, but... We're getting into them for a reason. They're different, but they're both not great. <laughs> okay. So the first use for PTFE, that first PFAS compound, was used to coat valves and seals on pipes containing uranium hexafluoride at a plant in Oak Ridge, Tennessee for the Manhattan Project. Mm. Very important for the uranium to not stick and get anywhere. That's uh, yeah, important. I'd say so. Not coat into the iron plumbing or anything, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you know what the Manhattan Project is. So will you just give a quick recap of your recollection of that? The Manhattan Project was, if I remember correctly, they were testing nuclear weapons or something, mm -hmm. yep. right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Which was... nuclear weapons were they testing for? It was for World War II, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So the uranium bomb, if you like watch. That's what it was. Fat Man and Little Boy, that's about the Manhattan Project. So, Got it. Yeah. So that was where it was first used. And then after the war, PTFE was marketed as, quote, the world's most slippery material and was sold through DuPont as Teflon. Oh, we all know Teflon. We all know Teflon. <laughs> and that's part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> so soon after that, DuPont's team found use for Teflon on household items such as nonstick cookware, again, which is what we're all familiar with. Mm -hmm. And the slippery polymers which formed Teflon presented a new frontier in chemistry that DuPont competitors sought to exploit. So former Manhattan Project scientists who didn't have jobs, essentially, after the war, they already had this experience with PTFE and PFAS. And so they were mm. recruited to companies like 3M, who brought in the man who first discovered liquids made of only carbon and fluorine. And his name was Professor Joseph A. Simons of Penn State College. So they were like, you're important. We're going to take you. We don't want DuPont to have you. 
Mm. And so Simon's contributions to 3M's fluorochemical project eventually led to the creation of PFOS containing Scotchgard in 1952. And that's the stuff that you spray under your pants so that nothing, or your shirts, so that nothing gets on it. It's like yeah. the preventative. Yeah. I mean, and it's I mean, like, does it waterproof it also? It waterproofs it. It like oil proofs it essentially. You can spray it onto your, like your couch. And so that'll keep like animal gunk off of it and mm. it'll keep kid gunk off of it. Okay. Yeah. You can spray it on everything. And unfortunately we did. <laughs> <laughs> So 3M also produced something called perfluorooctanoic acid, which was called PFOA, or they called it C8 because there were eight carbons in a single unit. So DuPont began purchasing C8 from 3M in 1951 to smooth out some of the lumpiness they got from just pure PTFE Teflon. So they were kind of working together a in little a way. Bit. Yeah, one was a supplier for the other. Okay. But C8 was also used by other companies as a surfactant for waterproofing clothes, greaseproofing pizza boxes, and protecting electrical cables. Like, it was just everywhere all at once, all of a sudden. By 1948, so going back a little bit before they started using C8, by 1948, DuPont was producing over 2 million pounds of Teflon a year. Oh, my God. And around the time that they began purchasing C8... Both companies were secretly becoming aware of the toxicological dangers of exposure to their projects. Oh, good. So, like, early on. In 1950, internal laboratory tests estimated oral LD50 values of some of their PFAS chemicals to be 1,001 milligrams per kilogram in 72 hours in rats. And these appeared to be, like, acute results. Even though it's over 72 hours, these seem to be, like... Still small enough time window. Yeah. And so this was indicative of a low to moderate acute toxicity. At DuPont, concerns were raised as early as 1954 regarding the potential dangers of C8 to their own workers. DuPont researchers investigated this, and they were able to determine by 1961 that C8 should be handled with extreme care. Possibly something that 3M already knew because they sent their C8 with instructions on proper disposition via incineration and specified that C8 that they made was not to be dumped into surface water or sewers. And so they already knew it was supposed to be handled with extreme care. Yeah. Yeah, they already knew, but DuPont found out after the fact. Right, right. Even after their own scientists determined that exposure to C8 was linked to enlarged livers in rabbits and rats, which is a classic sign of chronic poison exposure, which should not be easily dismissed. DuPont disposed of PFAS chemicals down drains that led to the Ohio River Mm. and dumped 7,100 tons of PFAS-containing chemical waste in unlined digestion ponds on their property, which eventually leaked like the PG&E ponds described in Aaron Brockovich and contaminated the drinking water of 100,000 people in West Virginia. And they knew. They knew. They knew. knew. Okay. There's no question about that. Nope. Wow. 3M had similar unlined trenches, which they knew were in the vicinity of local water wells for the town of Cottage Grove, Minnesota. In a 1960 internal memo, a member of the 3M geology department wrote to the engineering department saying, There will be wet acid and phenol waste as well as dry waste material. The principal bedrock formations underlying this area are the St. Peter sandstone intermittently covered with platfill limestone. The St. Peter sandstone is one of the aquifers of the Twin City area. It is not used too extensively in the downtown metropolitan areas, but it is used to a large degree for shallow wells in the rural areas. There are undoubtedly numerous wells in Cottage Grove, one mile to the south, which obtain their domestic water from St. Peter sandstone. Other wet wastes not neutralized nor deposited within rock or soil pore spaces will eventually reach the water table and pollute domestic wells. Eventual pollution of adjacent domestic wells will depend upon time, geologic conditions, and the rate of wet waste dumping. When waste seepage reaches the water table, certain solids by that time may be rendered harmless while others will remain to pollute wells. Degree of pollution will in turn indicate the time when dumping should cease. It may be that other factors will signify a time to abandon the site prior to maximum pollution. These factors will be housing developments, public relations, and new zoning regulations. 
So that was kind mm. of a long excerpt, but I wanted to put it in because it's so obvious in these internal documents that they that fucking they, knew. They fucking knew. And not only did they know, like, how toxic it was, they knew, like, the degree of the toxicity they were causing, mm-hmm. the magnitude, like, these are mm-hmm. going to be houses in the future. And yeah. there should be a point where it's like, yeah, this was too much, but yeah. we'll just keep dumping until then. Yeah, right. And they're like, we'll just keep looking. And we assume that it's going to, like, dissipate and there will be some sort of, like, biodegradation. And spoiler alert, there won't be. And they didn't know this at the time, but it's still, like, man. It, but that's you, a And that's a huge thing to assume. It's a huge thing to assume, for sure. For, like, a chemical that you basically just recently discovered this class because you didn't really work with polymers prior to, like, 30 years ago right Mm -hmm. like it's a new thing and like you're just assuming that you know all of this stuff when you know that it's toxic but you maybe don't know like you don't know how toxic toxic. yeah so (sighs) yeah but we can't can't get upset now because we have a lot more to go (laughs) (laughs) i think the worst part about it though is that it wasn't illegal yet so mm. all of this was totally, like, above board. It was par for the course. Well, because there weren't any – there couldn't have been any standards for it because it's a new chemical. Like, Well, and, like, for all chemicals, basically, like, totally, you can dump them in the Ohio River. Why not? Why shouldn't you yeah. be able to do that? It'll dissipate. So there weren't any independent studies on PFAS. Like, most of the studies that were happening were still happening internally for companies that were familiar with it, had a bunch of it, and could test it. Mm. And – Probably that was part of the reason that they were able to just dump dump their waste into major waterways with only a little bit of regulation. In 1958, 3M received a visit at their chemo light facility in Cottage Grove, Minnesota. Now it's a 1,750-acre plant that's roughly the size of a small city, and they dumped their waste into the Mississippi River back in the 50s and 60s. And the representative from the State Water Pollution Control Board expressed a deep concern at the readings he was getting for pollution levels coming from this chemo light plant. And in an internal report following the visit, a representative from 3M stated that he suggested that if we were agreeable, that they might come over the third week in September and assist us in analyzing our chemolite wastes, particularly at each operating building. We definitely want to discourage this as they might find something in our waste which we are not ourselves aware of and definitely do not want this information on the state health board's records. Yeah. Oof. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Damning. Yeah. He really said, yeah, he, he really <laughs> said we don't want them to catch us with the, our hand in the toxic cookie jar. Exactly. So the state health board would only find low oxygen levels. That's how they were testing for pollution. It wouldn't be until the 60s that an LD50 value would be established for most of the PFAS containing surfactants at 3M. And when they found these levels, the oral values in mice ranged from 180 to 6,200 milligrams per kilogram. Based on these findings, which now showed that many of the PFAS had at least moderate toxicity values, They instructed that, quote, due care should be exercised in handling these materials until further information is available on their physiological properties. But not, like, watch out, not, I don't, it's just, this is not enough. This, to me, is not enough. Like, what does due care mean? It's so ambiguous. Yeah. And probably for good reason. Right, yeah. And so those were all readings in mice. DuPont took their investigation a step further because they decided around the same time, we need to know a little bit more about this. And I would say they definitely took it a step too far because after they had already determined that C8 enlarged the livers of rabbits, rats, and dogs, the DuPont scientists conducted human tests involving human volunteers smoking cigarettes laced with C8. Oh, nice. Yeah. And like, that's a lovely combo. Like, let's already take something that's carcinogenic and, well, and they don't place know it with th- some unknown chemical. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't know, but they can assume that it is. Unsurprisingly, they found that nine out of 10 people in the highest dosed group were noticeably ill for an average of nine hours with flu like symptoms that included chills, backache, fever, and coughing. Wow. But 
as we've seen time and time again in stories where people are making profits, the people at DuPont and 3M decided to keep their findings to themselves so they continue raking in the cash. The first indication to the public that the waste from these PFCs might be posing a risk to humans came from an article in Nature in 1968 in which Dr. Donald R. Taves stated that, quote, It has been assumed that there is only one form of fluoride in serum. This would be human blood serum. It would therefore seem that the value for serum fluoride, which I found, must be an error. There's no intro to this because it was a 1968 article, and I guess they just mm. jumped into it then. Sure. But he doesn't know why there's the second fluoride. He wants to announce that he found it. He wants to say, like, hey, these findings are consistent with other findings, but they shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. I don't think that this can be read as, like, I genuinely don't know where this came from. You know, like, the findings I found must be an error. I think he's surprised at these findings. Like, I, how like how high these readings are, like... Or just that he's like, why do we have another form of fluoride in human blood? Right. Like, this is not okay. In his paper, he described the second fluoride compound confirmed in samples of human blood, and he concluded by saying, these findings are consistent with the presence of a fluoral carbon molecule, the origin of which he was unsure. So he was, like, on it. He knew that it was a fluorocarbon compound, but he didn't know where it came from. And again, this is 1968. So, like, he might have been aware, depending on what part of chemistry he worked in, he might have been aware of Teflon, or he might have been aware of C8. but if he wasn't reading, like, the Federal Registry or if he wasn't, like, in conferences where they talked about it, it's it's likely he had no idea where this was right. coming from. So the fact that he was able to, like, lower – like, pin it down and be like, this was probably a fluorocarbon, like, to me, that's amazing. But – you can't really do anything with that. You can't right. really you just point like out it's where that's there, but what do I what do I do with this information? Yeah. Yeah, and what does it mean? What are the consequences of that? So, like I said, he wasn't totally ignorant to the possibilities and by 1965, the uses of porofluorooctane, sulfonyl, you know, things like that, they were already being used on wax paper and paperboard. And so even if you don't see like these brand names, you can see these fluorocarbons essentially coming up for use everywhere like it's it's almost ubiquitous by the mid 60s and on top of that the big companies were also using them in a more ubiquitous way it wasn't just teflon it wasn't just scotch guard dupont wanted to get into some of this more like you know waxed paper paperboard type area and so they applied to the fda to use zonal rp as a food additive and mm. It wasn't going to be added directly to food, but because of the direct contact it would have as, like, the liner of the packaging, it had to, it had to get approved. FDA. Yes. Gotcha. As a food additive. And so that's how they made their petition to the FDA in February of 1966 is for it to be a food additive. But this initial petition was rejected in March of that year because DuPont themselves estimated that one part per million of their PFAS might migrate into the food and cause liver damage at elevated intake oh, shit. levels. Yeah. And the FDA had established a safe threshold for migration into food to be 0.1 parts per million, so 10 times less. But... This is to say that DuPont knew that their chemicals had toxic effects on liver function and cholesterol, and the FDA knew that. They admitted that freely to the FDA. Mm -hmm. But all that was done was that this single petition was rejected rather than anyone taking their foot off the gas for anything, right? And then what DuPont did suggest to try to keep this going was that maybe their migration estimates were a little high. Maybe we mm. were wrong and we just kind of overestimated. Mm. And so maybe the FDA should reconsider their petition without any additional toxicity information because that would, quote, appear to be out of the question for reasons of time and money. Mm. And they should reconsider how they felt about Zonal if they didn't think that it would migrate the way that they initially maybe thought it would migrate. Nice. And the representatives nice. of the FDA... They agreed to this. No. Despite the fact that DuPont's 90-day feeding studies in dogs had already shown toxic effects above the FDA's threshold. Why? No, no, no. Why? Okay. I, I, I don't know. Oh, okay. okay. So the reps who, I think they met with them in person. They might have just been writing. But the reps told DuPont that if they could prove that it was something else, 
in their studies, maybe the diethylamine salt that was present, which was causing the toxicity and the liver damage and not the zonal RP, that they would accept their petition. And, like, it's fine if you're looking at something that's complex and you're like, oh, we actually adjusted the variables and it turns out that the toxicity actually can be contrib- attributed to the diethylamine salt. That is great information to know. Like, it's sure. really important that we sure. know that. But... Why are the FDA so eager to find alternatives? Is I'm sure your question as well as it is mine. A little bit. And how is conducting this kind of toxicity study any more financially reasonable or like timely and reasonable mm-hmm. when they didn't want to do more toxicity studies to begin right. with? So I don't I don't fucking know. I don't get it. Yeah. Either way, that is what DuPont did. They were told that they could do that. They were told that they could reexamine the toxicity in that regard, and they submitted a new migration estimate in June of 0.2 parts per million, which is still above. It's still above what the FDA had told them in March would be acceptable, but it was below what was considered to be not acceptable. Okay. Yeah, that's a a happy place to be, right? Yeah. Okay. (laughs) But DuPont still could not prove that it was anything but the zonal, which was causing enlarged livers in dogs and rats. Either way, for whatever reason, in 1967, the FDA approved the zonal RP petition, despite the no effect levels for zonal not meeting their criteria. Why do they even exist? I I don't (laughs) know. If they're not going... Anyway. anyway. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. The following year, the same year that... Taves published his article in Nature in 1968. The FDA approved a similar 3M petition to use a PFAS in food packaging. So, again, it's everywhere. The big names are using it. In 1969, 3M petitioned to expand the use of the approved PFAS for food packaging. And although they found that this expansion, so this using it in a broader way but a similar way so they Mm -hmm. can use the same petition – They found that this expansion would increase the amount in the daily diet by 25%, which is, like, a lot. That's huge. But the FDA recommended approval of their petition still. Like, so 25%, whatever, this is fine. And, of course, in 1970, it was permitted, even though the FDA found that there could be potential migration of 4.4 parts per million. This and is an awful far way away from 0.1 yeah. parts per million. Yeah. Like, it, this isn't just – there's no line in the sand. Like, you're just saying no. numbers and then you're like, oh, well, it's fine. Yeah, it's whatever. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Everything's fine. And, like, I guess you could argue because I'm not sure exactly which, you know, polyfluorocarbon it was, which PFAS it was that, like, different migration was allowed. But it's, like, based on what we will learn later about – the FDA and the EPA and their understanding of, like, groups of chemicals, this seems like bullshit random numbers that they're throwing out for similar chemicals. So, in 1970, DuPont requested to expand their uses for zonal RP, despite finding that migration would not be the 0.1 part per million that they gave as their second estimate only two years before, but that the migration could be as high as 0.5 parts per million, which was above the not acceptable level. So it was very not acceptable. Please tell me the FDA did something different. <laughs> they did reject this petition. But when it was reevaluated in 1971 and the maximum migrations calculated by the FDA were found to be 0.09 parts per million, they accepted the expanded petition. Okay. So the use of PFAS is getting ubiquitous. Companies were aware of the presence of their chemicals in animals and humans, and they knew that they were bioaccumulating in the bodies of those who were exposed. And the FDA knew about these toxicity studies. And so the FDA was well aware that if it was in humans and animals, it posed a risk. And there, were they also aware that they were part of the problem <laughs> for letting it get this far? I wouldn't say that they thought they were part of the problem, but they were part (laughs) of the problem. (laughs) Let's be real. (laughs) Yeah. So anyhow, a study of fish in 1970 using a 3M PFOS firefighting foam, because PFOS is very stable and have flame retardant characteristics in at least some forms, Mm -hmm. they had to abandon this study because they, they were like, okay, we're finding it in humans, we're finding it in animals, let's try to figure out some of the risks that are posed to human and animal mm. exposure. And so they took fish because they were dumping their waste into the Ohio River. 
Right. Um, and so they had to abandon this study because even at very low levels, the chemical exposure caused all of the fish in the cohort to drown. We're causing fish to drown now. Yeah. yeah, which I didn't even realize was like a thing that could happen. Like I knew that like their bla- their air bladders would like be mm-hmm. bad, but yeah, the fish fucking drowned. Wow. So a professor at the University of Florida named Warren Guy was conducting research circa 1975 on the sources of fluorocarbons found in human blood samples in Texas and New York. And there was a confidential inter-office correspondence from 3M that documented his phone call to their photographic products division. And I don't know how they were using it in photographs, but it doesn't surprise me that they were because they were using it in everything. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Guy, like Dr. Taves had been, he was curious if 3M knew where the organic fluorine, which he rightly suspected was six or seven carbons long in a fluoroalkyl group, He was like, I found this. Do you know where it came from? And it's like, he is right on the money. And he saw that it wasn't present in any test animals that resided in the same areas of Texas and New York as his human samples. And so his hypothesis that he presented to 3M was that either they came from biosynthesis from inorganic fluorine. What does that mean? What does biosynthesis mean? It means that it was created in some sort of like biologic way in humans. Like maybe it was changed because of its presence in the human body from inorganic fluorine. And so I think he's probably hypothesizing that. The the body turned it into, like it took inorganic fluorine and turned it into the poly. That he's seeing, yeah. And I think he's concerned that maybe there is something going on with the fluoride in the water or, like, is something attaching to the fluoride in the water or is present in the human diet that is causing this polymer to be created. He really doesn't know, but he's like, it could possibly be this. It could be biosynthesis from aerosol freons because chlorofluorocarbons, fluorocarbons, you know, maybe. Mm -hmm. But he didn't find any chlorine, so he didn't really think it was that one. And then lastly, he was like, I think it might be Teflon or it might be Scotchgard because I know that those are fluorocarbons. Mm -hmm. And so this guy, Dr. Guy, he obviously knew what he was talking about. He was obviously right on the money. But the representatives of 3M pled ignorance with him and told him Scotchgard couldn't be a culprit because it was a polymeric material, but not a fluorocarbon acid. So what you're finding, that's not that's not any of our business. Mm. He was also told that testing had been done on water boiled in Teflon cookware, and the results were negative. We didn't find any additional PFAS in the water after we boiled it in Teflon, so probably not us. They suggested that Dr. Guy should waste his time in a remote location like New Guinea, where he could see if there were any fluorocarbons in the blood plasma of people who didn't use Teflon or Scotchgard, and then get back to them and see what he found. And it's like, you're wow. just literally you're... trying to send this guy to the furthest part of the world right now. You're literally telling him to go take a fucking hike. Exactly. They're exactly. literally telling you to go take a fucking hike. And so if you will please read from me the internal memo that they wrote to the rest of the company after Dr. Guy called them and they wanted to report it out. The least unlikely explanation is residual FC-143, or whatever, we sell to DuPont to polymerize TFE and Teflon cookware. This is still pretty far-fetched. This was not, I hasten to say, suggested to Dr. Guy. My recommendation is to keep scientists talking to scientists in the spirit of cooperative scientific inquiry. On the positive side, If it is confirmed to our satisfaction that everybody is going around with fluorocarbon surfactants in their bloodstream with no apparent ill effects, are there some medical possibilities that would bear looking into? Can fluorocarbon surfactants improve hemodynamics, wetting the capillary permeation of blood in cases of arthrosclerosis, kidney blockage, senility, and the like? Can hemolysis, platelet destruction, and other blood damage during hemodialysis and cardiovascular surgical procedures be reduced by fluorocarbon surfactants? I would like to suggest that we consider some animal experiments just to see how much of these materials can, in fact, be tolerated in the bloodstream, both from a defensive point of view and for the above intriguing reasons. What in the actual fuck? Wow. Yeah. yeah they're like, you So know, he like really went next level with it. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, well, if they do find it, what if it's a good thing? What like, if it's a good thing? Just go, but what if it's a good thing? Fuck yourself so hard. <laughs> yeah. 
I just how I can't. how like deluded some people are. I know, I know, and like it's just so out there in these internal documents. Mm-hmm. Like, if you don't want somebody else to read it and see what a piece of shit you are, don't write it down. Don't because... write it down. Don't think it. Just stop. Yeah, yeah. Maybe just take stop. a step back and yeah. Ugh. Wow. So yeah. Yeah, and I also don't think Dr. Guy was going to fall for the spirit of cooperative <laughs> scientific inquiry. Yeah. 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 Cuz he was working now with Dr. Taves, the author of that 1968 article. Okay. And they were trying to determine the origin of the fluorocarbons. They they weren't trying to just be like, "Oh, this is interesting." They were like, "This is not good. We are finding fluorine in human blood serum. It's not mm-hmm. good." So in 1976, They published another paper together that was presented at the Society of Toxicology meeting that year. Now, one of the articles that I used to research cited this 76 article, and since it was only ever published as an abstract of the presented paper and like a conference, I won't be citing the 76 version. And it's weird that that article I found did because you can't just cite an abstract that you found, like you have to read the article. But... I found a 1975 draft version, which was sent by Dr. Guy and his colleagues to 3M to show them what they were finding and to ask for further Mm. insight. So what they did was they tested 106 people in five cities that had between 0.1 and 5.6 parts per million fluoride in their water supply in order to clean the water. And they tested their blood for both organic and inorganic fluoride and found that 104 of 106 individuals tested had measurable quantities of fluorocarbons in their blood. Wow. They wrote, These findings suggest that there is widespread contamination of human tissues with trace amounts of organic fluoro compounds derived from commercial products. A series of compounds having a structure consistent with that found here for the predominant form of organic fluorine in human plasma is widely and commercially for the potent surfactant properties. The findings presented here that the concentration of the inorganic fluorine either in blood or in the public water supply and the earlier finding that there was little or no organic fluorine in the blood of the animals other than human are all in keeping with environmental sources such as these. And then they added, which I'm sure was to the pleasure of the readers at 3M, Little has been published about the metabolic handling and toxicology of perfluorinated fatty acid derivatives. This was surprising with respect to the widespread commercial use of such compounds. On this topic, it can also be stated that other chemicals are not usually toxic in blood concentrations similar to those found here for or organic fluorine. Yeah, they're not usually toxic in blood concentrations similar to those found here. So nobody, I think, thought that they were originally going to be toxic, but 3M and DuPont already knew that they were. They knew back in the 60s. They knew in the 60s, yeah. So now it's the 70s. We're more familiar with polymers. We aren't yet familiar with the toxicity of fluorocarbons, if you're not working at DuPont and 3M. And they, right. I don't know, I just feel <laughs> like they could have guessed that they, would, that they would behave differently from forms of organic fluorine. Like, Mm -hmm. the fluoride that was used in water sanitation. Like, it makes sense that those two things would be different. But, I don't know, maybe maybe Taves and Guy were like, we're not sure, based on what we do know. We're like, we're trying to stay positive, because already, over the course of only a couple years, like, they can kind of see that there is a looming disaster coming with Mm -hmm. the amount of fluoride that they're finding in people. I mean, 104 out of 106, like, it's still a small sample size, but, like... It's a small sample size, but it's almost 100%. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So the same year that Guy and Taves published their paper, 3M conducted more internal testing on their employees and found significantly elevated amounts of organic and inorganic fluorine in the people who worked with chemolite or in related labs. Of the nine samples tested from workers in Cordova, Illinois in 1976, all of them had organic fluorine levels in the blood that exceeded the literature range some of them by nearly threefold, and two of them exceeded the values for inorganic fluorine. Further investigation found that some blood levels had 50 to 1,000 times the normal level of organically bound fluorine in the blood, and that these high levels could be directly attributed to working with products like Scotchgard. Wow. 3M continued to do their own internal studies on the toxicology of their chemicals, but they never seemed to learn anything from them, or 
what I think is that the studies never seemed to confirm their own biases about the chemicals or gave them the information mm. that they wanted to receive. Right. And so they continued to run test after test that showed them the dangers of fluorocarbons, but they never took them off the market or changed their formulation or their processes for disposition. They just, like, ran the test and went, hmm, yep. Bad as we thought, and then just put it in the paper shredder. <laughs> like, exactly. Although not even because we have all of this documentation. Right, like, well, right, 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 right. Put that in that bucket that no one's ever going to read. <laughs> so in January 1978, a technical report was written by the Environmental Laboratory at 3M that revealed that at least one of the company's fluorochemicals was, quote, completely resistant to biodegradation which was contrary to the statements they'd been making about their products since the early 60s when they'd begun dumping. And I alluded to the fact that this was going to be a problem earlier. So they'd begun dumping the chemolite sludge and waste from their floral compounds into those river and digestion ponds. And maybe they couldn't have known this at the beginning, but I think they could have guessed that maybe this was going to be an issue because they literally used it in the Manhattan Project because of its stability and because mm. of its durability. So maybe we could have maybe considered maybe seen it. that it was going to be more stable than most compounds that we've worked with. So this 1978 report concluded its findings by stating that the results of this quite extensive study strongly suggest that FM3422 is likely to persist in the environment for extended periods unaltered by a metabolic attack. Its observed affinity for organics suggests that FM3422 released to the environment is likely to sort to organics such as those present in soil or in the sediments of aquatic ecosystems. And yet... Despite these findings, the 1978 3M light water ad brochure, which was used to market the light water flame retardant foam to firefighters, maintained copy which stated that, quote unquote, light water concentrate is biodegradable, low in toxicity, and it can be treated in biological treatment systems. It is concentrate form quote-unquote light water, AFFF, was found to be a slight eye and skin irritant, but as a foam solution, there are no noticeable negative effects. Tests and actual use situations have shown that animal and aquatic life are not adversely affected. Meanwhile, they had determined that their fluorad surfactant product, which was internally called FC95, was toxic. And in attempting to determine what doses were safe for daily exposure, they killed 20 monkeys, 16 of which were killed in a single aborted experiment that ended after all the monkeys died in 20 days, and it was supposed to be able to go until 90 days. Oh, my God. And this so they was, just had to scrap it because they're like, this did not go as planned. Exactly. And it was based, like, the initial values that they used were based on the 1963 LD50 values. And an acute dose of 450 milligrams per kilogram body weight, based on those values, should have been an extreme dose. But even doses as low as 4.5 milligrams per kilogram daily wow. were enough to kill the monkeys in less than the anticipated window. So it would seem that FC95 was far more toxic than they originally anticipated. Who's surprised there? But, like, what else was more toxic and how much more toxic was mm -hmm. it? This same compound was still being used out in the world despite not knowing what kind of daily values were safe to have exposure <laughs> to. And the following year, 3M documents indicated a need to test the blood samples collected from people in rural China for the presence of fluorad compounds. So the edge of the earth is getting farther and farther away. Right. Everybody's being exposed. Wow. Most of the testing being done internally at 3M focused on acute dosages, and this was pointed out in 1979 by an internal mem memo by a company scientist named Case, who was concerned that no chronic toxicity testing had been conducted on compounds which were known to be toxic, and Case was concerned that the fluorochemicals, which were known to be extremely persistent now in the environment, could cause prolonged exposure, which could have carcinogenic properties, and, like, probably did because of the enlarged liver in test animals. So, like, right. we're seeing all the red flags, mm -hmm. some people are pointing them out directly, and we're still not really doing anything about them. No, literally nothing. And then... Evidence of teratogenic properties of PFAS were becoming evident over at DuPont in the Teflon division. 
And that's when birth defects happen, birth defects. correct? Yes. Right. Okay. In 1981, they ordered all women working in the Teflon division to be reassigned to different positions in the company because two out of the seven women working in the division whom had recently given birth to children gave birth to children with birth defects, which wow. is 29% of their small sample size. At least one of these children with birth defects, a child named Bucky Bailey, required multiple extensive surgeries to repair his nose, which had a single nostril, and his serrated eyelid and keyhole pupil, which is where the iris and retina are not connected. Mm. He had difficulty breathing as soon as he was born, and these surgeries just caused, like, a lot of pain and took... Oh, I'm sure. Took years to, you know finalize essentially and bucky's mom recalled having to squeegee spilt c8 into a drain when it would spill over in her department sometimes but it wasn't just dermal exposure that was dangerous in 1980 when the lethal dose of c8 was determined to be about 1254 milligrams per kilogram which is equivalent to that of like thc and that's orally in rats they also found that it was even more toxic than that when it was absorbed via inhalational exposure. And so that's even more fucked up if you think about the cigarette studies they did in I the I was 60s. just going to say, I was like, just going to say they were telling them to literally just suck on that poison. Yeah. And like, what happened to all those people? Are they, I, I yeah. So I'm sure there was little to no follow up with how those people did. Yeah, I'm sure. Even if those people came knocking on the door like, hey, so I don't I don't feel so good. Could it maybe have to like, yeah, we don't know you. Yeah. Are you? Or well, you signed you signed the thing. So. Right. Right. So despite knowing that they were the reason for these birth defects, the company put on the same old capitalist song and dance and told the mothers that they were to blame for the health problems mm. that their children faced. Even though the reason for the move was a rat study, like officially the reason for the move was a rat study conducted by 3M, so a different company, that indicated that rat pups whose mothers were exposed to C8 were more likely to be born with eye defects. And this information was shared with the employees of DuPont, so it was shared with Sue Bailey, whose son was born with an eye defect, and they were still like, eh, it was probably you, though. It was probably something that you did. And... When the women were moved in DuPont, this was the first time that men working at DuPont, not the higher-ups, just the regular analytical chemists or the mm -hmm. people who were squeegeeing C8, this was the first time that they had been informed of any danger related to working with Teflon as well, although they were assured that the chemicals posed no threat to them as men. Even the women, they were like, it doesn't really hurt the women, we're more concerned about the fetuses of the women, right. so as men, you're like, fine. Like, everything's fine. You're fine, Yeah. And, like, obviously, they weren't fine. And, like, Sue Bailey knew that. Everybody knew that. But what could they do? Like, Sue Bailey actually tried to sue DuPont, but there was no lawyer in Parkersburg, West Virginia, that would take the case against their town's largest business and employer. They were like, we are not fucking touching that. And so now we're about to enter the 80s. And I just want to have a quick recap because this is all going to be very important. So let's revisit the dump sites that were being used by 3M. They had the Mississippi River and unlined disposal trenches in Cottage Grove near their chemo light plant. They had more unlined trenches between Cottage Grove and Woodbury, which were only used from 1960 to 1966. They had unlined pits in Oakdale, Minnesota, which were used prior to 1959. And some of their waste was buried at this site until 1950 and then placed into sealed drums and stored along the Mississippi River until 1955. And then they had their Washington County landfill in Lake Elmo, Minnesota, from 1971 to 1974. So they have multiple sites across multiple areas. And because of the persistence of the PFAS, they were able to seep into the soil, as we kind of knew that they were going to. Right. And they were able to seep into the groundwater for years after these disposal sites ceased usage by 3M. In 1974, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency began to more closely examine leachate from these landfills, and they began to see some serious pollution resulting from landfills, which were considered sanitary previously. In 1979, the MPCA began to focus on groundwater and hazardous waste, like just overall, not specifically for 3M. 
and in 1983, there were two acts passed to remediate uncontrolled releases of hazardous substances, including releases in locations that were already designated as landfills. So well, this because, is good news. Yes, and because of these internal crackdowns, they start really looking at 3M. And this led directly, I think, to 3M being cited for pollution violations for the first time in 1984. And I think that these citations and their place on the MPCA radar led to them beginning to actively lie or maybe lie harder and in ways that are more Mm. obvious in documentation. Because they attempted to publish another internal technical report summary from the environmental lab that claimed that FC-95, which they previously said is, like, super fucking toxic, and they claimed that this was readily biodegradable. But they don't use blanks in this study, and they didn't actually look at FC-95 or light water. They examined a mixture, which is not an accurate representation. Like, if I were to say, like, oh, I'm looking at milk, but I diluted it with water, like, that is not the same thing. Right. (laughs) (laughs) And so this report means nothing, but they decided to use it. And it doesn't establish that PFOS are readily biodegradable, so it doesn't undo the previous study, which showed that they're incredibly persistent in the environment. And The fucked up thing is that both studies were conducted by the same scientist at 3M. So you can't even be like, oh, different departments weren't talking to each other. They didn't know. No. No, he knew. He knew. So in their correspondence with the FDA regarding the expansion of Zonal RP for food packaging, DuPont was bold-faced lying to them. And I believe that they probably were before in order to get their migration estimates passed. But... In 1987, they reported to the FDA that they expected a migration of 0.2 parts per million, despite knowing that the migration of 0.62 parts per million was possible. So now they're just fabricating information. They're just completely flat out lying. Mm -hmm. And and that is above even the quote unquote acceptable level. Yes. And for their part, DuPont was also not disposing their waste at all properly, considering the care that was supposed to be taken with the C8 that they were buying from 3M. When they did take the most care with the disposal in the early 1960s, they buried 200 drums of C8 along the Ohio River. At some point prior to 1965, they also started filling drums with C8 and then placing them on barges to be pushed into the middle of the ocean for disposal. Mm. And this practice only ceased because of some bad PR they got when a fisherman scooped up one of the drums in a fishing net. So after that, they're like, oops, we won't do that anymore. And they just started (laughs) dumping their Teflon waste into landfills. Oh, okay. So much better. So much better. From 1984 to 1991, DuPont also began a secret campaign of collecting tap water from local areas, including employee homes, schools, and businesses. They were having their employees essentially gather water in buckets and bring Mm. them back to DuPont. And what they found was that C8 was contaminating public drinking water in Ohio and West Virginia at significant levels, even at distances which were many, many miles from the offending plants and disposal sites. No. Yes. And these findings were voiced at a somewhat infamous now 1984 meeting between 10 of the corporate business managers at the DuPont headquarters in Delaware. This is where they asked questions about should we reduce our emissions now? Should we switch to a new surfactant? Should we eliminate using 3MCA altogether? But of course, their main concern was that their corporate image and their bottom dollar might but be of impacted. Course. Right? Of course. Notes from the meeting stated that, quote, legal and medical will likely take the position of total elimination, unquote, but that the current methods for reducing their pollution in affected areas was not economically attractive. And they also came to a consensus that, quote, C8, based on all the information available from within the company and 3M, does not pose a health hazard at low-level chronic exposure. How would they know that if they haven't done any chronic testing? Right. How? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's so. all been a pack of lies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like the, like, 80s beat you got going on Thank there. You. <laughs> when you just you. need a synthesizer behind it. Thank you. <laughs> Furthermore, the execs at this meeting concluded that, quote, we are already liable for the last 32 years of operation, unquote. But in that case, what was the point of reducing emissions or stopping use of this chemical? 
which they knew was environmentally persistent, if they already had this much of a body trail that could lead to them. It's... <laughs> To me, I'm like, I'm looking at them saying this and being like, okay, do you crack your phone and decide, like, it doesn't matter if you run it over with your car now? Like, right. we've already been doing it for 32 years. Why should we stop Why do we now? stop now? Like, we've already affected tens of, if not of hundreds of thousands of people just with the water issue. Mm -hmm. Just with the, not the actual even product itself. Like, right. we're just talking about the water. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Like... Yeah, well, and the smokestacks, because when they do incinerate it and it goes into the air, we know that when it's inhaled, it's even more toxic. Yeah, yeah. they're like, just why not keep keep hurting more people? Yeah, I mean, if we can keep making money until we get caught, why wouldn't we want to keep making money until we get caught? <laughs> so C8 production was not reduced. Rather, it was increased following <laughs> this meeting. And so, in turn, was the disposition of the C8-laden waste via dumping of sludge into unlined landfills or the Ohio River or burning it in smokestacks that released 19,000 pounds of C8 vapor into the air in 1984 alone. Wow. That same year, the Tennant family, living near Parkersburg, West Virginia, had the ill fortune of selling a 66-acre portion of their farm to DuPont, with the understanding that the land would be used for the disposal of non-hazardous waste, and they've renamed the site the Dry Run Landfill, which was named after the creek that ran through the plot and into the pasture where the tenants no. allowed their cattle to graze. I know it's not, it's already not setting up to be good, No, right? this is not, yeah. <laughs> so soon after the sale, Wilbur Earl Tennant began to see changes in his animals. It used to be that the cows he raised would nuzzle him and be friendly to him when he came to milk them, but now they charged people when they were approached, and he saw something change in their eyes when he looked at them. The creek would also start to swell in his pasture when there hadn't been any rain, and sometimes foam would flow on the surface of the water. Cattle and wild animals began to die, and so in 1997, Wilbur brought his camcorder out to the creek and began to record. I want you to notice his height. I want you to notice what his eyes look like. They're born that way. Now, I never saw nothing like this in my life. And very unusual. This is what I'm talking about. We haven't had any rain now for several days. This sud has been here for a while. I've taken dead deer and dead cattle off of this ripple right here. And every veterinarian that I've called in Parkersburg, they will not return my phone calls or they don't want to get involved. One hundred and fifty-three of Tennant's cows, the source of his livelihood, had already died, and no veterinarian in Parkersburg was willing to help him. Possibly because they had some idea of where this would lead with the DuPont Corporation just upstream. And Wilbur was doing his own necropsies. He filmed the close-ups of the blackened calf teeth, the discolored, dark green livers, hearts, stomachs, and gallbladders, the malformed hooves, and the receding eyes of the animals. And the ones who lived were plagued with constant diarrhea and drooling. Mm. This is the VHS tape that Tennant brought to a lawyer named Rob Bellot, who agreed to take on the tenant case and take DuPont to court for their obvious contamination of his family's pasture and the death of their cows. A federal suit was filed in 1999, and although the case would be settled quickly and quietly, it was the hole in the dam of information building up against all of the PFAS and 3M and DuPont that would eventually burst and leave all of us struggling to find out where to go from there. But that is a story for next time. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please like, follow, subscribe, and review us everywhere you get your podcasts. For more Lethal Dose content, you can find us at Lethal Dose Pod on Instagram, Tumblr, and TikTok. For an overdose of content, subscribe on Patreon for exclusive episodes and much more. 
The show theme is Look Far by our dear wizard friend Fogweaver. More of their music can be found on bandcamp.com. Lethal Dose is created, researched, produced, and edited by Kayla Woods and Venus Dineko. Stay safe and remember, the dose makes the poison. <laughs>